Welcome to another session, Searching for Answers. We're still searching. We find some answers, and we find some always some new questions as we go. We're glad you're with us because you're the most important part of this program. So thank you for joining us. We are looking at Timothy, First Timothy, that fascinating letter to a young pastor uh, who is still learning the ropes a little bit in a, pro a church that's problematic in some ways. But we'll see what the text meant back in those days when it was first written and what its implications are for us today. Joining us on the panel discussion this evening are Dr. Leo Ranselin, New Testament scholar, associate dean in the School of Religion here at Loma Linda University, and Dr. Catherine Coe, a scholar in both history and religion at La Sierra University. My name is John Jones in the Divinity School at La Sierra, and we are getting into chapter four of First Timothy. Find your Bible, whatever is the the, the, the translation that works well for you, and we'll get right into the text. We looked last time briefly at chapter four, the opening four verses, which are loaded with some very different instruction from what we've seen in chapter three. Not contrast or not conflicting with it, but contrasting. So now we're dealing with an issue where there is a tendency in some circles of this congregation at Ephesus toward some extreme attitudes, strange uh, ways, which have to do with their sincere attempt to foster their spiritual life. But they're doing it in ways that drive a wedge between the spirit and the flesh, such that the spirit is being advanced, they think, by putting down the body. And uh, they have mistakenly, perhaps, reconceived of marriage as a primarily fleshly thing. Mm -hmm. That is already a mistake to be making. Uh, certain uh, foods that are uh, maybe uh, sensed to be indulgent in some way, they're putting off to the side. But the result is that they're starving themselves. This is not health reform. This is health deform in a way, isn't it, somehow? Mm -hmm. Now, so we, uh, with that behind us, we can take up chapter 4, verse 6, down through maybe 10 or so. Mm -hmm. um, Leo, take us through it and see where it leads us. Sure. Chapter uh, 4, verse 6. If you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters... You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales. Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. <coughs> The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and struggle because we have set our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Isn't it interesting how this letter can refer to the Savior as God? Mm -hmm. We see it already in chapter 3. Huh. Yeah, he says, uh, I'm writing you in verse 15, so that you can know how to behave in the household of God, mm -hmm. the church of the living God, mm -hmm. who, then it goes right on, revealed in flesh. Well, that's the incarnation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But he can use those expressions quite interchangeably, and we see it here too, don't we? And in 2-3, you know? right? Uh, for sure. Yes. God our Savior. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. So um, uh, clearly, uh, this whole letter conceives of the entire Godhead as engaged in the incarnation mm -hmm. and in the and the deliverance of humans mm -hmm. from demonic uh, teachings and bondage to sin. What else do you see as you look at this? So you know? as we look at verse 6 there, he says, mm -hmm. if you put these instructions, what is the these instructions? It seems to me, yeah. uh, if we look at 4, 1 through 5, it's to clearly take on the false teaching that's present at the church of Ephesus, but perhaps most importantly, to underscore the importance of God's creation 
that it is good and not to be rejected. So that is a teaching. It seems to me that uh, Timothy does need to, as he says here, put before him and, and to teach and instruct the brothers and sisters who are part of the household of God. And then he says, if you do this, you're going to be a good, and in the original, it's, it's, it's where we get this word, uh, diakonos, right? A good minister, you could say. Not just servant, but a good minister of Christ Jesus. And then I love, nourished on the words of the faith yeah. and of the sound teaching that you have followed. So I think this letter, at least for me, in a, in a beautiful way, brings theology and praxis together. Yeah. Uh, they're organically related. Uh, sound teaching, or the orthodox faith is something you must always be teaching and instructing the, the believers of the household of God so that practical living, right, the living out of the, the theology, if you will, occurs in a manner that is in harmony with God's will. And we're going to talk more about that in yeah. the latter part of this, where he yeah. underscores the fact, hey, you need to train yourself in godliness, right? Mm -hmm. It's a discipline here to, mm -hmm. to work out and to live out the, the Christian faith, certainly not in a way to earn salvation, but so that you can be a good model, an example of <laughs> godliness is the word he uses. Yeah, Sound yeah. Teaching. They apparently need it, and so it's timely advice for them, isn't it? What do you see in the text, Katie? What strikes I, do you there? I'm really focused on verse 10. Uh, For it is this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of believers. You, you think about disciplining your body and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of energy. If, anyone, if you've ever tried to start an exercise regime or deprive yourself of, of uh, food or certain kinds of foods. It takes a lot of focus and energy to do that. But he's saying, take that energy and focus instead on our hope in the living God. Rather than spending your time and energy on these things that you know may matter a little or may not matter at all, or may just be bad for you in the end, rather focus on, on hope on hope in Christ, I think that that's really quite beautiful. Um, the other thing that, that <coughs> sticks out to me is, is this word labor, labor and strive. And I've been spending a lot of time in class talking about concepts of labor recently, um, particularly the idea of the alienation of labor, the idea that we need to be connected to the things that we produce and what that means uh, to people. And mm. here you have him saying, we're laboring and striving for something that's living, and we need to be connected to it. So he's saying that part of, of who you are mm. as a human being is to, is to put your energy and your efforts into this relationship with God. Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think if we go back to the beginning of chapter 4, he talks about marriage and food, and um, marriage isn't a relationship that takes effort. It takes labor, but it produces something good. Food, creating food, whether you're growing it or you're cooking it, takes quite a lot of labor. Um, but these, these are things that are worth spending our energy and our time on, rather than chasing after false ideas and prophets and old wives' tales. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are people who take their spiritual growth seriously. They do mean to, to be uh, quite devoted about it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that aspect is affirmed here in verses 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. The toil, the struggle, there is a certain kind of self-discipline involved. <clears throat> but it needs to be rightly calibrated and addressed in the right direction, right? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I think of my daughter, um, I spent a lot of time purchasing a present for her. She was one and a half at the time, and her aunt had also purchased a present for her, and she opened up this present, and it was 
a doll. Um, and she kind of looked at it and <laughs> set it aside. <laughs> and then she opened the present from her aunt and, and was so excited and started playing with it immediately and was very engaged. And I feel like the writer of this book is saying, you've spent all this time mm -hmm. on the wrong mm -hmm. gift. <laughs> it's not really the thing that you need to be doing. And yeah, this is the train. There might be uh, here in verse eight. Yeah, physical training, I guess, has some value, mm -hmm. but it's all about training and godliness. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a hint of some kind of asceticism that yeah. may be mm -hmm. taking place there at this mm -hmm. church at Ephesus, which we can tie to some of the other false teachings there that uh, depreciated the God. Yeah, creation. these these disciplines hold promise. Uh, mm. It makes you think you're going to grow spiritually, and yeah, he says, you know, it, it does something for you. Right. But it's it's a kind of a concessive remark, isn't it? Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to say is I, I try to read each New Testament document with this eschatological framework of the already and the not yet, uh -huh. and try yeah. to ascertain the tension yeah. mm -hmm. and how each yeah. uh, author sketches that. And I think it's perhaps particularly important for Adventists who are charged with proclaiming the soon advent of the Lord, but that in this epistle, the focus is really upon the already and how we ought to live within the mm. household of God. Mm -hmm. There's just a hint or two here of reference to the second coming. I think we have it here in this passage where he says, uh, the life to come, the yeah. living God. And then in chapter 6, uh, to keep the commandments without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, you know, they're there, but the focus is really on these hymnic confessional statements and how one ought to live now within the household of God, where there's order and stability and a powerful, gracious, and loving witness to outsiders. It seems to me that's where the focus is yeah. on this letter. And we as Adventists sometimes don't appreciate that sufficiently, I would say. Yeah, so the, the, the promise is a double promise. It has a, it has a twofold uh, kind of uh, fulfillment in the present life, verse 8, and the life to come. Mm -hmm. both, they're they're there. both lined up side by side there. Yeah. And uh, I think that's deliberate. That's very, very telling. So this expression in verse 9, the saying is sure mm. and worthy of full acceptance. Yeah. We've seen that already in chapter 3, verse 1. Yeah. And, you know, the scholars argue about whether it applies to what follows or what went before. Uh, you'll get different commentaries going different directions on that. But I guess what I'm after here is that there's a kind of conventional wisdom about some of these things. Yeah, people say this, people say this. Yeah, that's valid. It's true. We're, we're, these, are, these are truisms that people ex accept. So, uh, but take them seriously. Don't... Mm -hmm. um, don't trivialize the spiritual life, the Christian walk, somehow. Um, we probably should also highlight the first part of verse 10. Yeah. To this end, we toil, mm -hmm. you know, we work and we struggle. We struggle. Yeah. And that in 2 Timothy is going to come out even more so, where there's this call to Timothy to endure, to be mm -hmm. steadfast, mm -hmm. to be faithful mm -hmm. with the recognition that um, as we discharge these responsibilities that we've been entrusted with, we are going to suffer. Paul makes that very clear in 2 uh, Timothy to Timothy. Uh, you know, he calls him to share in the suffering that he goes through. And here we have a hint of it. Um, the Christian walk is not, uh, is at times a challenging walk. It, it's one in which we toil and struggle yeah. to live it out here mm -hmm. on yeah. earth. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And um, and sometimes hope is a struggle. Sometimes it's difficult when we live in a sinful and difficult place to focus our hope. It feels better to, to, to languish um, on occasion, but he's saying if you just fix your hope on Christ, um, it's, it's going to be good. You're, he talks about uh, this concept of nourishment as well, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of sound doctrine. I, I love these terms. These are very kind of 
healing and um, and filling terms that he uses because the truth of the matter is is it's going to be hard mm -hmm. but it's it's going to be good for you too the thing I was at times hoping is that uh, uh, Paul would sketch how we can be more missional towards outsiders mm -hmm. uh, because again and again we have this reference God desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth mm -hmm. The living God is a savior of all people. There's this wonderful expression of God's redemptive purposes for all of humankind. And yet, um, uh, evangelistically, we don't really have a sketch of that, uh, how to go about that, with perhaps a one exception is that if you uh, express godliness within the household of God, conduct yourself in, a, in a, an appropriate way in harmony with God's will, that that will be a witness to outside. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself will be missional. Mm -hmm. That's to, the to point outside. of departure for the evangelism. At least yeah. that much is there. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not much more. It seems not much there. more. Yeah. Huh? Right. Huh? Yeah. So, yes. Now, this, this thought goes on. It's developed in verses 11 through 16 um, and unpacked a little further. What does this mean in Timothy's life? Mm -hmm. So now we get this. You want to help us uh, read through that, uh, Katie, and see? Yes. Prescribe and teach these things. Yeah. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Okay, Timothy, here we go. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. <laughs> all right. First of all, insist on this and teach it. Yeah. I really feel for Timothy on a personal I do too. level. Yeah. I, I started teaching university courses at the age of 24, yeah. and I started by teaching a senior level course. So my <laughs> students were about a year younger yeah. than me. And it's hard. It's hard it's to hard. be young and to try to tell people who are older than you how they should be living their lives or even just what's going to be on the exam. Um, and so what we have our author saying is, don't let them look down on your youthfulness. And again, yeah. here we have another cultural touch point. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, you know, it, it was important at that time to, to look to those who had experience um, it, it still is in our own time, even though now we have a little bit more of a worship of youth going on in our particular culture. Um, but he's saying if, if you want respect, if you want gravitas with the people that you're working with, that you're teaching, you need to have these things. You need to do these things. And um, it, it looks like it's going to be a lot of work for Timothy. But it also, he's also being hopeful. He's saying it's going to be worth your while because you will ensure your salvation and the salvation of those who hear you, mm -hmm. right? So here's the road. It's hard, but it leads somewhere quite beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It is hard when you're young. The, on the one hand, you, you, you can be intimidated. On the other hand, you may want to compensate by swaggering in and, mm -hmm. and asserting yourself and trying to say, okay, people, I may be young, but, but I'm going to, here's how it is. You have to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Timothy is to thread that needle somehow here. Mm -hmm. Don't let people look down on you because you're young. But the way to co properly cope with that situation is simply set an example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's been told already how he's to behave, chapter 315. Yep. <laughs> I've spelled it out for you. Now just live this out in your Christian life. Respect these people. Don't speak harshly to an older person, chapter 5, verse 1. Mm -hmm. 
and they will respect you. They, you, will, you will win their respect in that way. Uh, this this um, chapter 4, verse 12, is an excellent uh, theme verse for preaching to young people, yeah. people mm -hmm. in, in, in youth ministry. I've used it often, and um, I, I think it's, it's not merely convenient, it, it, it reveals a profound truth about, about age and youth and how, right. how in the family of God we hold hands together. Right. right. And, yeah. so, oh, and I would also say, as, as a historian of the Protestant Reformation, mm. there's also quite a bit about work ethic in here as there well. There is, there is. This there idea is. that you need to work hard. And um, I, I think that that's actually really hopeful because... Um, it's not just based on, on pure talent. Yes, God has blessed him with certain gifts. Yes, um, he's, been, he's been ordained um, through the laying on of hands. Um, but that doesn't mean that you get to be lazy. <laughs> you, can, you can actually pursue this lifestyle. And I'm, he's not saying you're saved by works, but he's saying that that's going to create fruit. You know, that's going to actually cause something to occur. Um, so what you're doing in your labor matters. Yes, yes. Right. There are two persons in here that get elevated to be examples. We saw that in chapter 1 where Paul says, God's Christ has made me an example of those who would come to believe in him. Uh, and now Timothy is to be an example in speech mm -hmm. and conduct. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. two persons elevated here be examples mm -hmm. and models to the church. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I'm struck with is, hey, do, and I, I'm with you. I feel for Timothy. Here, don't neglect the gift that's in you. Uh, and in 2 Timothy, he's going to say, you need to rekindle <laughs> the gift. <laughs> that makes me wonder. He was quite perhaps overwhelmed with the pastoral situation that he had at Ephesus, that he got discouraged, that he needed to be supported anew later on. But in any case here, hey, remember this gift that has been entrusted to you through the laying on of hands by the council of elders here, this, this uh, group of leaders within the church. Uh, recognize who you are, you know? And in this way, we, we, we've read that God saves us, but that salvation comes maybe not through works righteousness, but mm -hmm. certainly through the discipline of the faith, right? Mm -hmm. You will save both yourself and your hearers. Right. Now, this does not mean that you will somehow um, be responsible for your own salvation through your good doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that you will foster the spiritual growth and nurture of your hearers by demonstrating it in your own life. Yep. That all may see your progress, verse 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? Apparently, this is a congregation that cares about that. They care about spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. They're interested in maturation. They may be doing it in funny ways, mm -hmm. but That's this right. is an issue for them. Now Paul says, okay, take advantage of that. Show them how it's done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Verses 15 and 16 are remarkable verses. That's yeah, so they really underscore are. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. The yeah. discipline, the, the, the training in godliness, if you will, to yeah. go back to 4.8. Right. That is called upon of pastors and leaders. You know, that was an audacious thing. If, if we have a picture here of experienced and, uh, may we say, um, seasoned leader like Paul, mm -hmm. dealing with what is apparently a fractious and problematic congregation. Yeah, no doubt. They've had some, a history of some difficulties with their elders and leaders, with their pastors. And Paul puts precisely his youngest colleague right. in that situation, <laughs> knowing it will be a bit of a trial by fire, but that somehow Timothy's makeup is the right one for these people if he can just be true to the gospel, true to what Paul has taught him, and in, true to Jesus, and in a certain sense, true to himself mm -hmm. as a de delivered disciple of Jesus. 
that we can, we do indeed. I, I, join, I join you in feeling for Timothy, but I think we all also salute Paul mm -hmm. in a certain wisdom uh, that saw Timothy's potential and said, you know, this might just work. Mm. And I wonder if that's because Timothy is so different from his congregation. Because uh, huh. here are people who care about certain things. We're told earlier that you know the women are wearing pearls and having yeah. their hair braided. These are this is a wealthy congregation, yeah. um, and you're, you're sending Timothy out there yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a disciple um, yeah. to, to preach and to teach to these people. He's young. He's not. He's not well on in years, and but he still has this great character, this great initial something inside of him um, that that demonstrates to his superiors that he's he's really quite special. And those things that make him special are not those things that his congregation mm. are currently mm. prioritizing. Mm. Mm. It's not wealth. It's not interesting conspiracy theories. It's not. Um, it's not the uh, oh there there are there's lists there are yeah. lists in here but but rather it's it's having a, a devotion to the ministry being being called to it um, and so he's reaffirming what Timothy mm -hmm. probably had before mm -hmm. he experienced some burnout mm -hmm. as a result of his congregation but I I think that that's probably why Timothy was sent he he creates this this. Uh, he demonstrates that that what they're caring about is not necessarily what they ought to. And look yeah. at Timothy. Isn't he an example of, if this is what you cared about, this is what you would look like? Yeah, that's, that's very perceptive. Well said. He does have some things to draw upon. On one level, the ritual level, I suppose we would say, he has the simple fact of his ordination. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's right. mentioned this. Yeah. Uh, so he, the brethren have believed in you enough, Timothy, take that confidence and vindicate it now. <laughs> right. so there's that. He also has a certain gift. We don't know exactly what to make of that yeah. in verse 14. Is it the gift of prophecy? Is that what's meant here? Mm. Um, but there is some spiritual uh, uh, nurture and resource within his life that he can draw upon in good ways. So there's that. Mm -hmm. So Timothy... You know, don't let that flame uh, flame out on you or mm -hmm. burn low. Uh, pay attention to it. Don't neglect what you have to work with, because it's all from God. Right. This is you're not you're not there on your own human resources. You do have something to work with. So let's see now if we can channel it right. You know, get it, get the energy, the spiritual power, the devotion, the assurance. And the humility, right? Flowing together in ways that will actually bear fruit in your life and in the life of your hearers. This is a shared pilgrimage toward the kingdom. Start walking it together. We'll see you again next time, searching for answers.